in the last session, I made several points about uh, in intellectual structures of organization and professional formats in writing. And to quickly review that material, what I said was that intellectual structures are tools uh, to plan a report, gather and analyze the data, uh, and, and put the information in a format for the audience. These intellectual structures tend to be sequential in order. Uh, for example, if you are building a house, you build the house from the ground up, and you build a skeleton or a frame building from the inside out. You put the wiring and plumbing pipes inside the frame walls before um, uh, you, you put the uh, walls on. In the same way, uh, an intellectual structure, like a timeline, um, is a way of organizing tasks in order in according to time. Using these rational structures helps focus on parts of the task, uh, organize our time more efficiently, uh, gain clarity and help an audience understand better uh, the, the thesis statement um, and, and uh, um, all those are, are different intellectual structures. Two essential parts of these intellectual structures and formats are the working hypothesis and the thesis statement. The working hypothesis um, is an initial stage to help focus and organize the preparation of the report. Once the data has been collected and analyzed, the working hypothesis can be revised and turned into a thesis statement. Um, these issues are covered in chapters seven and eight of the textbook. Because of the importance of the thesis statement in a professional report, part of the criteria uh, for marking assignments in this course is the quality of the thesis statement. If there is no thesis statement, I can guarantee that the person who does the marking assignments, and that's me, um, will give a lower mark. Um, professional standards, professional formats um, are, are the standard and expected formats. Uh, when you enter, I, I suggest you uh, mute your mic because uh, this is being recorded now. Um, professional formats are standard and expected formats in professions and disciplines. As the text says, the formats are standard and expected in communication within specific disciplines. If you don't use the format, um, your audience may be confused and you look disorganized and incompetent. If you use the format, your thoughts are probably better organized, your audience will probably understand better, and you look com competent. Thus, your report initially looks more credible. For example, because of the standard thesis, uh, because of the standard format in the, pro in the professional report, the audience knows there will be a thesis mm -hmm. statement in the professional report. That thesis statement is at the beginning, and um, there will be data as evidence uh -huh. that the thesis statement is correct, and so on. And because of the format, the readers, because of the standard format, the readers expect these, um, these elements to be there. Um, the same criteria you can use for, that you use for organizing a report are the criteria, criteria you use for analyzing the validity of a report. For example, if you are analyzing a report, you examine the thesis statement and you, and you judge whether the thesis statement is 
supported and properly interpreted in the report. If the data is missing, the report is flawed. If the data does not support the thesis statement, the report is flawed, and so on. Note that the first assignment in this course is the analysis of a research article. And the first assignment is to analyze the research article and mm -hmm. uh, uh, later assignments uh, are to write a professional report and uh, write research articles. Um, so now I'm going to go into some uh, specific structures. Okay, so in this session, the um, structures that are going to be discussed, the formats that you're going to be given are um, the generic sequence of process, uh, generic professional format, generic, uh, generic policy business format, um, structure for multiple claim statements, format for an interim report, which is uh, another term for a progress report or an initial feasibility report, uh, format for a final report, and some ideas about an organic format. That's a more creative format, and typically we wouldn't get that um, in, in a standard um, uh, professional uh, format. Okay, so let's go to the first one. Okay, a generic sequence of process. So this is an overall professional structure for organizing a report. This would begin with the research problem, identifying the research problem. Uh, in some cases in employment, you are given the research problem. In other cases, um, uh, it's up to you to uh, create the research problem. Uh, assignments in this course will give you both opportunity. Both um, you will be given a research, an option to create a research problem, or you will be given an option to create uh, your own research problem. So, essential part of the, this overall process is to begin with the research problem. Uh, next, you from the research problem, you formulate a working hypothesis. Um, and this working hypothesis will solve the research problem. And that affirming the working hypothesis is a crucial stage. But remember, it's called a working hypothesis. So it hasn't been finalized yet. Next, you formulate the questions that need to be answered to find a solution to the research problem. Next, you identify the data and the human sources relevant to answering the questions of the research problem. And next, you collect the data, and then you interview the sources. Typically, it's better to collect the data before you interview the human sources, uh, because that gives you more knowledge in dealing with your human sources. Okay, next, you analyze the data and information from sources. Next, you determine if the data and information from sources confirm the working hypothesis or the working hypothesis needs to be changed. That's a crucial stage. Um, checking and, and, and to make sure that the working hypothesis um, is supported by the data and the sources. At this stage, if the working hypothesis needs to be changed, you need to get more data and information, and you do need to do more analysis. At this stage, um, you're ready to term the working hypothesis, which is a kind of provisional hypothesis, into a conclusion and a thesis statement. Um, you now begin the report with the conclusion and the thesis statement, and now you're ready to work on drafts of the report and organize the report 
in the sequence, but what helps the audience understand best. So you notice that this structure separates the elements in stages and creates a sequence for those stages. And in the last session, I gave you examples of what happens if you don't separate and organize the tasks into sequential stages. Uh, the result can be uh, chaos in, uh, in your own report, and that translates into a problem of you explaining um, uh, chaotic information uh, to uh, the audience. So let's look at a sample thesis statement. Uh, this sample thesis statement is taken from a research article uh, by authors at uh, Massachusetts Institute of Technology who are uh, doing empirical studies on what is happening um, to information on the internet. And this is the, the thesis statement in, that, in this article. I have put this um, article for you, uh, posted it for you on Moodle, if you want to see the full research article. So, uh, you know, this, um, this type of article would have a, a title, and the basic idea is that false information spreads faster on the internet through social media than true information. So here's the thesis statement. Um, the article uh, begins with a bit of a pre pre uh, preamble of a couple of sentences, which is a description of the methodology, just to give the audience a brief summary of the methodology that gives credibility to the research article. After this brief preamble, the research article gets to this thesis statement, which I posted up here. So you see it, it's an, it's an academic language. Falsehood diffused significantly farther, faster, deeper, and more broadly on the internet than truth in all categories of information. And the effects were more pronounced for false political news than for false news about terrorism, natural disasters, science, urban legends, or financial information. So you can see um, that summary is very concise and very focused, and it gives the uh, readers a roadmap now to what this research article is going to demonstrate based on uh, empirical surveys. So the summary continues. We found that false news was more novel than true news, which suggests that people were more likely to share novel information. Whereas false stories inspired fear, disgust, and surprise in replies, true stories inspired anticipation, sadness, joy, and trust. Contrary to the conventional wisdom, Robots accelerated the spread of true and false news at the same rate, implying that false news spreads more than the truth because humans, not, Roman, uh, not robots, are more likely to spread it. So in a few sentences, this is a very focused thesis statement. Now the reader knows exactly what this research article is going to attempt to prove empirically, and now uh, the audience is prepared to judge and evaluate whether this research article can support the, um, the thesis statement. Uh, uh, just by way of, of context um, for this, uh, this research, um, the empirical study was uh, by the authors was of Twitter from 2006 to 2017, and the data was 126,000 stories tweeted by 3 million people more than uh, 4.5 million times. And um, a research article also indicates how it defines 
the criteria of what is true and false uh, false news. It's it's not just the author's um, assumptions and tuition about false and true news are, but they actually give criteria for how they uh, determine what is false and what is, is true news. Okay, so that was a thesis statement. Okay, um, so a generic professional format. Um, in, in general, this is what you would expect to find in a uh, professional report. It would begin with a title. Um, there would be an introduction with the, th the thesis statement. Um, the thesis statement has various names in uh, different disciplines, sometimes called a claim statement, an abstract, an executive su summary, a summary lead. Uh, but all those variations in terminology essentially mean the same thing of a thesis statement. Uh, next, you would typically find the context and the background. Um, uh, somebody is getting a bit of feedback. If you would mute your microphone, please. Um, next, you would get, like I said, context and background. Um, next, you would get a definition of terms when the definition is needed. And typically, uh, this is something that you find missing from student assignments, um, the definition of terms. Very often, there's a, an assumption of what um, the term means. Um, typically, you would find the explanation of me the methodology when it's needed. Some, uh, some disciplines um, are more typically report methodology than other disciplines. Uh, next, you would find data, facts, and evidence. Next, you would find expert opinion. Next, you would find analysis. Uh, then you would find the uh, conclusion with a restatement of um, the thesis statement. And finally, you would find the resources and the bibliography. So that's a, a, a generic uh, professional format. Um, and of course, it depends on how, uh, how long the report is, um, how many of these items it has, and in what detail it has these things. This is typically what we would find in a professional report. Notice that it is sequential. Um, it's sequential to um, build credibility. It's sequential to divide um, the parts into separate elements so that they can be examined se separately more fully rather than everybody, everything thrown together like a stew, um, uh, everything mixed together. And, um, and that, that kind of uh, mixture is chaotic and, and sometimes hard to get clarity. So that's why the separation of elements is important, structural element. That's why the sequence um, is important. And the sequence uh, aids in clarity, and it also aids in convincing the audience that, um, um, that uh, this, um, this report is credible. OK. In, in a more a business type of context, you get the similar similar things. You get the introduction. Um, this time it's called the executive summary. Typically in the business format, at this stage you find recommendations uh, because uh, typically a business report is um, is is guiding um, in in decision making to take action or not to take action. Then typically there's the context and the background, but the context and the background is what is strictly relevant to the thesis statement um, and doesn't include elements that are irrelevant 
unnecessary or distracting. Again, you see the uh, definition of terms. Um, again, you see methodology. You see the repetition of this format, data, facts, evidence. You see uh, expert opinion. You see analysis. Now, in a, in a business report, uh, here is typically where we get to a stage of options and recommendations. Um, so, in a, in a business report, somebody is likely being tasked with producing a document for the people who make the decisions. Um, typically, the person preparing the report um, is not the decision maker, and so the document needs to be very clear and, and give the decision makers a solid basis for making the decision. So typically, um, um, since the person writing this report is not the decision maker, the author gives options and recommendations to those making decisions with the power to make decision. Then there is the uh, conclusion with restatement of the thesis statement and resources and bibliography. Okay, um, here are some elements in the formatting structure of, uh, of a typical uh, report. Um, some suggestions are to put titles and subtitles in bold letters and use white space around the titles and subtitles to set off to set them off and make them easier to see. So uh, in the previous uh, slide where I showed some different elements, typically each of those elements and parts would have a title or a subtitle. Uh, best advice is not to use italics and not to use all capitals since research showed uh, that these, um, these forms for uh, letters make the letters harder to read. Um, bulleted items are useful. And in fact, you see right here uh, that in these slides, I'm using bulleted items to separate items. Uh, bulleted items make it easier to find and digest the elements in series. Uh, visual elements are very useful. And uh, the text we're using in this course, the craft of research, has a whole chapter on visual elements, and we'll look at that later in this course. Um, visual elements like tables and charts and graphs are really useful ways of communicating um, large amounts of data that are difficult to digest uh, just by giving the reader um, a lot of facts and figures. And in a minute, I'm going to show you some examples of turning uh, data into charts so that um, um, the, um, the data trends are easier to uh, evaluate at a glance visually and easier for the audience to, uh, to understand. Um, this is a whole art in itself, turning data into charts and graphs. Um, and uh, the literature on this advises that some type of information uh, is best in one type of chart versus another type of chart. In a minute, I'm going to give you some examples of displaying uh, data uh, visually. Um, and uh, as you get into this uh, chapter in the course text, you'll see that the chapter says um, that the, the graphs can mislead by implying false correlations and compression of data on a chart can exaggerate. But it is uh, turning a complex and extensive data into a visual chart is a very useful way of communicating. So here's, here's an example uh, from last year about coronavirus cases. Now, you can see the data follows a, a, series, a series of six months. Um, 
and it uh, follows five different countries. And each of these countries is color coded. So it's very easy for you at a, at a glance to absorb this data and formulate conclusions and interpretations. So, for example, you see at one point that Spain um, had a, an upward trend um, in coronavirus cases, but then something happened where uh, France uh, vaulted ahead of Spain in a number of cases and rose uh, very high and uh, rose to a peak and then started to decline. Uh, you see um, that Italy has a very straight edge trend in inclination where Spain and France are uh, irregular or bumpy trends. You see Germany um, is, uh, is able to flatten the curve in coronavirus cases um, uh, better than other, um, other countries. You notice that these statistics are uh, per capita, so that they're not based on the absolute numbers. That is, some of these countries may have a larger population and some of the countries have a smaller population. So the absolute numbers um, uh, are not an accurate indication of how well the country is doing. The per capita cases allow us to compare each country on an equal uh, basis to give us a, a more clear picture of what country um, uh, uh, of the, the trends and increase and decrease. So you see from this how easy it was um, to look at this chart uh, and to understand um, understand this chart and to form um, interpretations that are supported by the data. Now, this data does not give us the cause. Um, it doesn't tell us why one country has an upward trend, uh, an irregular upward trend, and why another country um, like Germany is able to um, do better on a per capita basis and, and flatten the curve. Um, that's going to be a, another um, uh, another type of analysis, and it's a, it's a more difficult type of analysis to determine the cause of something. The point here is that um, if I've given you um, all, the, all the data in a list uh, uh, for these five countries over six months, um, you, you have a, a chaos of information uh, in your head, and you wouldn't be able to formulate a, a clear uh, idea of what the trends are. So the, visualizing the data uh, in this case works very well uh, as a structure of analysis and also as a structure of communication. That is um, uh, being able to convince people that the analysis is correct. So here's another um, uh, data map, and this is literally a map of the world, which is color-coded. Um, and uh, um, so you're, we're so familiar with these type of color-coded um, uh, data maps so that we understand that the darker colors represent uh, more uh, intense numbers of the coronavirus cases, and that we see a progression from uh, intense concentration of cases um, to, to lesser concentrations. Well, again, um, this data mapping allows you to analyze and communicate complex data um, in an easy way that uh, people are able to understand as a glance. So your, your eye just flips over this data map uh, from the intense uh, cases to um, the, uh, the lesser intensity. Again, imagine that this data was given to you 
number by num number, country by country, um, um, it would be harder for you to uh, digest and analyze than this, this kind of um, data mapping, literally data mapping. Okay, here's another example. Uh, this one we're probably familiar with watching, um, you know, the last two U.S. presidential elections in the United States. Um, this is another, literally, a data map looking at the Electoral College uh, uh, votes uh, in a U.S. presidential election. And I think this is for the 2016 election where Trump won. And... Uh, and it's color coded in terms of, uh, of Republican uh, versus Democrat. The blue is um, uh, Democrat, the red is Republican. Okay, um, here's another, here's a structure of analysis. And this is a structure of analysis from the text in analyzing the claim statement or thesis statement or working hypothesis of a piece of research. So typically in a thesis statement uh, of a research, uh, a research article, when you analyze it, you may find that the thesis statement can be broken down into separate elements, which are themselves each thesis statement. So what initially in the presentation may look like one thesis statement, when you break it into its parts, you get multiple thesis statements, multiple claim statements. And so as the text is advising, um, this is an important to structure of analysis to break a thesis statement or claim statement or executive summary into its se separate elements of its claims so that you can analyze each claim separately. And the text gives you a very simple structure for analyzing a thesis statement, which is um, actually multiple claim statements. You're going to judge each one separately and make sure that each one independently um, is supported. So in this case, we're hypothesizing a, uh, a claim statement or thesis statement that is actually three claim statements. So we separate each one. And what the text advises is a simple structure of separating these claim statements. Uh, so um, in this sequence, we take claim statement one, then the text advises us, identify the implications and consequences of claim statement one. Next, identify the reasons supporting claim statement one. Next, evaluate the evidence supporting claim statement one. Next, um, uh, analyze whether the conclusion supports the claim statement. Now, that structure is a structure for analyzing the validity and credibility of a thesis statement. But, it's also a structure for you to organize your thoughts and organize your own claim statements. So you can do the same thing when you're writing a document. You can take your claim statement or you can take your working hypothesis and separate it into uh, how many different uh, elements that are to this working hypothesis in, in your work. And then you identify to yourself what are the implications and consequences of your first element of your working hypothesis, what reasons do you have to support this working hypothesis, 
what evidence do you have to support this working hypothesis? And then does the conclusion fit um, in terms of uh, implications, reasons, and evidence? So this is also is a tool for you to analyze um, um, the research documents of others and a tool for you to organize your own work. And you can be sure, particularly since this is in the text, that when I'm marking an assignment in this course, that's what I will be looking for. When I mark an assignment, the first thing I will be looking for is what is the claim statement. And then I will follow this kind of methodology and make sure that um, the student's assignment is clear about the consequences and implications of the claim statement, that the reasons support the claim statement, that the evidence supports the claim statement, and the conclusion is valid. So this is a structure for analyzing the work of others and for organizing your own analysis. So you see the structure um, it here is you've gone through this with claim statement one, you go through it with claim statement two, you go through it with claim statement three. Um, and uh, the advice would be to organize these in terms of importance. And the importance is found in the implications and consequences. So, so claim statement one, as it's been organized here, would be the most important claim part of the claim statement. And it's the most important part of the claim statement because of the implications and consequences. So you can organize the structure of breaking into separate parts of the claim statement or working hypothesis or thesis statement. You can prioritize them in terms of importance, starting with the most important and working to the least important. And that would be typically replicated in your document. That is um, your professional report. Um, is going to begin with a claim statement, and it's going to deal with the most important part of that claim statement first, and the least important part of that claim statement last. That's a structure in communication and a structure in organization. If, however, somebody does not prioritize um, the parts of the claim statement in terms of implications and consequences, the result may be spending too much time and effort on the least important part of the claim statement and spending the most time on, uh, on, on um, and, and neglecting to spend enough time on the most important uh, part. So um, you, um, you, you get this in, um, in the course text and what the course text calls this is storyboarding, which is mental mapping. And here's a, a graph um, that's more representative of, of how this is, um, is given to you in the text um, um, in, this, uh, in this kind of, uh, of sequence. And the advice of the text there is um, to put the logical structure in your argument, visualize your plan, make the logical relationships visible at a glance. And that's at your stage of organizing um, uh, your work, um, uh, organizing your analysis. Okay, now I want to distinguish between um, an interim report and a final report. An, inter an interim report um, in a professional setting can also be called a progress report. Um, it can be called an initial feasibility or an initial feasibility report. Um, and so I want to distinguish between what we mean um, in a professional setting by an, an interim report and what we mean by a final report. First of all, it's important to um, recognize that an interim or a progress report does not mean it is unprofessional. 
Informal does not mean unprofessional. Un unprofessional. Um, in the workplace, if you're delivering an interim or progress report, it should be just as professional and well organized and well thought out as a final report. Um, we recognize, at the same time, we recognize that an interim report, um, while it's thorough, is provisional. And provisional means that we're only partway through the process. So the information is preliminary, the analysis is preliminary, and final conclusions can't be drawn. And so we have to recognize that. And of course, be careful not to promise too much in an interim report or be too conclusive in an interim report. Uh, an interim report, just as a final report, needs to be based on facts, evidence, and sound methodology. methodology. It should not be based on speculation and, and guesses. But we recognize that it is provisional, and that means that some data is still being gathered and examined, examined and there may be gaps in the information at this stage. The gaps in information are not excuses for being lazy and sloppy. And uh, when there are gaps in, in data in the interim or, professional or provisional report, you want to identify that to the audience so that you don't create a false impression that um, all the information has been gathered um, um, and, and the conclusion is more definite at this point uh, than it can be. Okay. Remember that final conclusions aren't possible in a provisional report, but provisional conclusions are. You might say uh, it's likely um, that uh, this report will conclude. So you have to be careful in the wording not, not to draw conclusions too quickly that will be later shown to be false. You just, you just conclude what evidence su supports the provisional conclusion and you identify gaps in information. The difference is that a final report needs to have all the necessary facts to be conclusive. Uh, if there are gaps in the final report, gaps of information. Uh, they should not be because of laziness or sloppiness. The gaps need to be identified and the implication of the uh, gaps need to be um, clearly stated. So um, um, at some stage, at, you know, in this final report, um, it may be necessary to say the result is inconclusive and explain why the result is inconclusive. Um, if we're more conclusive um, than justified, that would be a mistake, and it's a mistake in employment, and it could result in action being taken uh, that, that is disastrous. And then, of course, um, if the action taken on the basis of your report is disastrous because um, your conclusions were more definite than they should be, um, that's going to be disastrous for your career. So uh, one example of this kind of uh, disaster in uh, conclusions that weren't supported um, is the 2003 uh, American invasion of Iraq. Um, um, to um, destroy weapons of mass destruction that didn't exist. The problem was that the wording of the intelligence uh, supports reports that supported the invasion made it sound uh, the conclusion uh, sound more definite than it should have been. The intelligence report basically said there are weapons of mass destruction um, in Iraq, therefore justifying the invasion, rather than indicating 
that it was a possibility and a percentage possibility um, that uh, that there was some that there was some doubt about the ability to make inclusion. So that was a um, disastrous um, a disastrous outcome because the intelligent report report that justified the war in Iraq um, was uh, sounded more conclusive than uh, it should it should be. The final report needs to make it clear how the conclusions were reached. Um, and um, since this uh, final report is going to the decision makers, um, um, it um, the decision makers need to know how the conclusions were reached in order to decide if the conclusions are valid. And from there, the decision makers um, will make a decision. Okay. Um, typically, an interim report is shorter. Um, its function is to explain what the progress is so far, and it projects or predicts what the longer final report should accomplish. Um, depending on how long um, you are told to make the interim report, um, uh, it can report progress methodology, working assumptions, uh, changes in, in project status, uh, information on project completion, unexpected incur occurrences, either positive or negative, current and anticipated problems, the need to change, change requirements for the project, the timeline, the need for more time, or need for more resources, modification of techniques, acceleration of the project to meet deadlines, possible incomes. So you see there's quite a lot that, um, uh, there's quite a long checklist that you could have for uh, what you would put in a good interim report. The function of an uh, interim report is typically to give the decision makers, the managers, feedback. And um, before the project is completed, before more time and resources have been allocated on, on, a, uh, on the project so that the interim report allows decision makers to give feedback to the person, the author of the report, and it allows the decision makers to make interim decisions and adjustments. So the decision makers might decide uh, to allocate more resources or they might decide to allocate less resources. They might decide to extend the project. They might extend, uh, decide to end the project before um, it reaches the final stage. Uh, typically, an interim report will have timelines, and that breaks the process into stages, and that shows um, what has been accomplished so far and what remains to be done. And typically, when you're organizing a long project, um, you would create a timeline. Um, you, um, you would um, create a timeline as an intellectual tool to organize the sequence in which you would do things um, for maximum efficiency. OK, so uh, we recognize that the interim, uh, the function for the interim or progress report is first of all to let the manager, the decision maker, know what kind of progress is being made. It alerts the manager and decision maker if anything unexpected has happened, if there need to be changes in direction, lets a manager decide on the change in direction, uh, lets a manager decide if it's worth continuing allocation of resources, um, might request more resources and and shows if the final project will be on deadline. So you can see that doing an in, the structure of an interim report, um, the structure can help you plan and organize work on the interim, um, uh, plan and organize work on the, on the report, and also uh, communicate to others, particularly if you're coordinating a group, a timeline is useful in coordinating a group, 
making sure everybody is doing their portion of the task at the right moment of time and able to put it all together and, and it helps uh, helps uh, then you communicate uh, to the decision makers. Um, so we typically in an interim uh, report would have a structure in it um, um, that which, which I've identified here as sequentially as introduction, issues and background, implement, implementation plan and progress, project timeline chart, expected result, and references. So this would be a generic, a generic structure for an interim report. Uh, the, in, uh, the introduction um, would identify the purpose of the report, why the report is needed, relevant background, time sensitivity, uh, often in business or uh, government, um, there is a time sensitivity, um, the anticipated result and deadline for the final report. That, that would, we would expect to be in, um, in the introduction. Notice in item two, um, the level of urgency of completing the task. Um, and then we go through uh, again, stage three, again, urgency and time factor is important. And, um, and uh, again, we're breaking this all into, uh, into stages. Okay, for the final report, we have a, uh, a structure, we have the report summary. This is uh, very similar to a thesis statement in a business context or in a government uh, context where you're making uh, policy recommendations, um, the report summary functions like the thesis statement and um, it will have the recommendations, the findings and recommendations, uh, which uh, will then be proven and supported by the document. Um, uh, next we have the general uh, introduction with background and purpose. Uh, we have the methodology, um, and uh, methodology can get us into uh, certain structural tools for decision making, which we can look at uh, separately in uh, in this course. Uh, some of these uh, uh, analytical structures are visual and are very useful in a visual form. Um, we can look at, um, in the final report, a section on how to implement the report and conclusions and recommendations. Um, the longer the report, the more detailed these sections would be and the more sections we might have. So typically in a final report, um, there should be a methodology. Um, showing the reader and decision maker that the, um, the report is sound because the methodology is sound. If the methodology is flawed, then uh, the report may be flawed. And that's something very easy for um, uh, the um, reader uh, to analyze. Uh, the reader needs to see the methodology in a long final report so the reader can judge um, the soundness of the methodology and the soundness of the report. And sometimes a report can be dismissed or, or, or there can be skepticism about it simply because the methodology is flawed. Um, the Final report, since it has more time to be completed than the interim report, um, um, it, it um, allows for a process of elimination. Um, so uh, in, in, the, um, in the time taken to do the final report, there may be some minor issues that come up and they're judged to be so minor that they don't appear in the in the final 
report, they, they would just uh, um, make it larger uh, and more complex than it needs uh, to, be, to be. But for sure, the analysis of findings needs to be more detailed and extensive in, in the final report and um, the options more detailed. Okay, I want to finish up with just a, a, a brief exploration of organic forms. Now, um, for the most part, what I have given in this session is standard, um, standard formats, and those are standard and expected. Um, you don't expect a professional report to deviate in formats, but under certain limited conditions, um, the uh, writing of a document might be more organic with but, uh, how many you helps to um, shape, shape me. Um, the, uh, if you moot, moot your mic for a minute, I'll be finished in a minute and, and have time for questions. So, um, if you were doing uh, an organic form that uh, uh, grows and falls, uh, the example I just gave is, is the image of, um, of a bonsai tree. And uh, bonsai trees are, are, inter are interesting because they are structured, that is, they carefully cultivated and clipped, but they're structured to look natural. So it's an interesting combination of uh, forming something but trying to find an organic or a natural form. But typically an organic form like this, um, uh, we would expect some kind of thesis statement, uh, breaking the thesis statement with component parts, ordering that, and, uh, and then the form uh, grows and evolves. But as I said, typically um, uh, this uh, uh, would not be uh, something that you would expect in, um, in, in a professional, uh, uh, professional report. Okay. Uh, okay, that's the end of that. And so um, uh, I am now um, just taking a minute um, to, um, um, uh, to stop the recording here. Um, okay. Okay, and and that and.